just south of Milwaukee. The three of them sat in a restaurant alone. The chef, the waiter, were the only other people in the restaurant. And there sat the man who was in a couple hours going to be named the new coach of the Milwaukee Bucks, Mike Budenholzer, along with one of the biggest superstars in the NBA, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and another player from the team, Chris Middleton. As they talked, Mike Budenholzer, who would, who would in a couple hours be introduced to the world as the next coach of the Milwaukee Bucks, told Chris that his role on the team would need to change under his scheme and under his philosophy. He would now have to play off the ball, meaning, for those of you who aren't basketball fans, he would play out on the wing, and he would now have to have the ball passed to him and wait for it. This was a change, a drastic change, in how Chris Middleton played his game. And at first, he rejected it. He brushed against it, and he said, I, I don't, I don't want to do this, essentially. The season started, and then in a game in December, on December 1st, against the New York Knicks, one of the most pathetic teams in basketball, the Milwaukee Bucks, who, are one, who have the potential to be one of the best teams in basketball, were losing to the Knicks, who are actually trying their best this year to lose games so that they have the best odds of landing a phenom out of college. If you're not a basketball fan, just follow along with me. <laughs> Believe it or not, people being paid millions of dollars a year are actually trying to lose basketball games. And the Bucks were losing to that team. And Chris Middleton wasn't playing within the scheme that the coach wanted him to play within. And so he was benched for the entire fourth quarter. The Bucks would go on to lose that game against the Knicks. After that game, there was a meeting, a long meeting, between Budenholzer and Middleton. They aired their grievances. They shared where they felt that each had let down the other. And at the end of that meeting, Chris Middleton had agreed to go along with the plan. The results? This year, he's averaging two more points per game, than he, more than his career average. He's, at, he's averaging one and a half more rebounds per game than his career average, and he's averaging an extra assist per game over his career average. Last month at the NBA All-Star Game, the Bucks had three representatives. Coach Mike Budenholzer, superstar Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Chris Middleton, who was named to his first All-Star Game of his career. Because he was willing to change roles. He was willing to go along with the plan, even though he didn't like it at first, even though he didn't understand it at first, he was finally willing to go along with it, and he's now experiencing more individual success, and the team's experiencing more collective success, all because he was willing to change the way that he looked at it, and he approached it. Now, this is a theme that we've seen often in sports. And that theme is this. Rarely do the most talented individuals win championships. Rarely do the most talented individuals win championships. Winning demands playing as a team. And playing as a team demands sacrifice. We've seen this in the sports world repeatedly. We've seen this in the business world. We see it all over that rarely do the most talented individuals succeed. But much more oftentimes, it is the team that functions well that succeeds. And what prevents that from happening oftentimes with the most talented individuals is that teamwork requires sacrifice. It requires giving in. It requires not looking out only for yourself, but for the others around you. This morning, we're going to look at God's design for marriage. 
And we're going to look at some themes that are countercultural. We're going to look at some themes that people have, have misunderstood. We're going to look at some things that, that people might even initially say, no, doesn't apply to me. I'm not doing that. It doesn't work for me. And yet, what we're going to see is, number one, our culture has missed it. Number two, a lot of people with good intentions sometimes have missed what this really means and if we just get through all the noise and we really commit ourselves to looking and trying to understand God's design in marriage, that like anything else, when we, when we get through everything else and just get to the heart of God's design, we will see it will be the best way. Now, you've, you've heard a saying, maybe you have it crocheted in your house up on the wall. Happy wife, happy life, right? We've all, we've all heard that saying. And there's a lot of truth to that. But as my wife could attest to you, that if dad's not happy, there are not many people happy either. And so, yeah, happy wife, happy life, it's good. But I would counter that with something else. And I would counter that with happy spouse, happy house. Because if you've lived with a grumpy man, you know that can be just as miserable. That, it, it, ladies, don't be elbowing your husband right now, all right? All right, no pointing, no pointing. So don't be elbowing your husband, don't be pointing, all right? We all know. But if you've lived with a grumpy guy, if you've lived with a jerk, you know that, yeah, if he's not happy, then, then the house isn't happy either. Now, Ephesians 5 is where we're going to look this morning. You can follow along in your Bible apps, or if you don't have those on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on the screens. But Ephesians 5 discusses how we should live in community as people who follow Jesus. Ephesians 5 is, is talking about how we should live in community. And verse 21 of Ephesians 5, and it's, it's not there, but this is a foundation for what we're going to look at. It's a, it calls for all of us as followers of Jesus to submit to one another. It calls for all of us as followers of Jesus to submit to one another. See, part of following Part of following God means that we elevate others, that we look at other people as though they are more important than ourselves. And so when some jerk cuts us off in the parking lot and takes the spot that our turn signal's been on and we're indicating that we're about to turn in there, rather than rage at them, our thought process needs to be, other people are more important than us. Like, completely countercultural. But that's part of what following Jesus is all about. It's elevating others above ourselves, elevating the needs of others more so than us. And now we're going to look at the specific ramifications of this within marriage. And so we start in Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands as as to the Lord. Now, I know a lot of you guys right now just mouth amen. You're a little scared to shout that out, but you're like, mm hmm, that's what I'm talking about. We're so glad we're here today. Preach it, Brian. Now, listen, a couple things about this idea. First of all, submission doesn't make you weak. I understand that just this word in our culture has a negative connotation. And that this idea that if we submit to something, we have to be a doormat. And we have to let everybody walk all over us and we don't matter. No, no, no. Submission does not make you weak. It doesn't make you less than. It doesn't mean that you have less value than somebody else. And it isn't blind obedience. Listen, it is not blind obedience. And some people have equated this idea of submission to be blind obedience. And it's like, well, I said it. That settles it. You better follow along, wife. If you want to please God, then you follow me because I said it. And you need to submit. No, no, that's, that's not what this idea is. It isn't blind obedience. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. So we have some qualifiers here. If your husband is leading you into a dangerous place, if your husband is saying something that, that doesn't follow through, this is what biblical submission means. Not that you follow along that path, but rather 
Biblical submission means that you have a disposition to put your husband's needs first. That you have a disposition to put your husband's needs first. It doesn't mean blind obedience. It doesn't mean blind loyalty. It doesn't mean if he tells you to do something that is destructive. It doesn't mean that if he's abusive, you go along with it. That's not this idea of biblical submission. The idea of biblical submission is that you put your husband's needs first. And that is your primary disposition. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, this is interesting. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. So what we see here in this picture that the Apostle Paul is painting for us, bringing it back to Jesus in, in his love for his people, what we see here is this excludes chauvinism right off the top. This is not some chauvinistic call for guys to puff out their chest and be, walk through life as though you have an underling next to you that you are in command over. That is not biblical submission. This excludes that idea. You don't walk around saying, submit, woman. No, that's not biblical. And don't ever call your wife woman. It's never going to end well. (laughs) And this definitely, definitely excludes abuse. Jesus is the model. Jesus is the model. And when he says submit in everything, understand this idea is not every single issue, but rather the idea of every area of life. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. And understand this was written in a time where... The vast majority of marriages were arranged marriage. So you didn't get to go through the dating process where you started to develop feelings for each other and you, you know your families would come together and a lot of this would be arranged marriages. So you had very little say. And oftentimes marriage was an issue of convenience and so there wasn't much into the factor of attraction But it was just, no, this is a convenient marriage for this family, and this family thinks it's a convenient marriage. Congratulations, kids, you're married. Wouldn't you have loved to grow up in that time? And here's the Apostle Paul, and what is is God using him to say to us? Husbands, love your wives. Listen to me. Love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. There are feelings involved in love. But if you determine your feelings to determine your love, you are in trouble. Because there are days you're not going to feel like loving the person you're married to. Love is not a feeling. But rather action. And you have to work your way to a feeling sometimes. And it can be hard and it can be difficult. But the command is husbands love your wives. You can't get around it. It's there. Wives submit to your husbands. You can't get around it. It's plain. It's there. Husbands love your wives. You can't get around it. It's plain. It's there. And oh, by the way, here comes the standard. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Husbands, elevate your wife. Lift her high. Put her on a pedestal. Her needs are more important than your needs. That's what loving someone as Jesus loved us looks like. It looks like we set the tone. 
Husbands, we set the tone in service. We set the tone in love. We set the turn the the tone in valuing other people. Elevate your wife. You need to sacrifice for her more than she could ever sacrifice for you. That's what God's called us to. That her needs and her desires are more important than your own. That you would elevate her, that you would protect her. It was 2.17 in the morning. And we heard the rustling on the door. My wife is a heavy sleeper. I'm a very light sleeper. And I shot up out of bed and just sat there and listened. And I could hear somebody was trying to get in. Reached over and I shook her very gently. She didn't budge. Shook her a little harder. She didn't really move. And then I really shook her, but I put my hand kind of over her mouth because I didn't want her to scream because I thought somebody was in the house. And she was awake then and she thought somebody was trying to kill her. And I'm like, shh. And she looked at me like, If whatever that is doesn't kill you, I'm going to finish the job. (laughs) I'm like, baby, somebody's trying to get in. Get your phone. Dial 911. Don't send, but be ready to send. And know if I die, I love you. (laughs) She didn't know whether to kill me at that moment in time or whether to be touched. So she got her phone. She dialed 911. I got out of bed. I tiptoed to the door. I breathed in. Pulled my shoulders back. Flexed my non-existent biceps. (laughs) It just felt good. Put my hand on the doorknob. Looked at my wife and mouthed, I love you. But it was dark, so I don't think she saw it. (laughs) But if they were going to make a Hallmark movie about this, they'd have included that part. (laughs) I pulled down on the doorknob, flung open the door, said, ah! (laughs) And I almost peed my pants. When the cat that had somehow broken out of the room that it slept in ran and jumped up onto our bed and started meowing. The whole wrestling against the door was the stupid cat that had busted out and was trying to get in our bedroom. This was the part of the or worse vows that I had made when I got married. I never wanted that stupid cat to live with us. And now the cat had taken two years off of my life, scaring me to death in the middle of the night. Gentlemen, when you hear the wrestling in the, in the house, don't send your wife up to go check it out. You be the one that goes and checks it out. You are to love her. You are to cherish her. You are to value her. You are to protect her. Those are all things that Jesus has done for us. And those are all things that we are called to do. We need to set the tone. We need to set the tone with love. In the the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And so we never, ever, ever have to have this mindset or this idea as what I want, I get, because I'm the leader. That's not the mindset. 
that we're ever to have. We're never to have the mindset that we get whatever we want because whatever I say goes because I'm the leader. Elevate her above yourself. Love her with as much as you love yourself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it. He cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Nourish her, cherish her, elevate her. Let her pick the restaurant that, you want, that she wants to go eat at. Spoiler alert, after 20 minutes of indecision, you're going to get to pick anyways. <laughs> and on the rare occasion she actually does have a place in mind, then great, go. And if you don't like it, suck it up. If you want to go to Hawaii and she wants to go to Alaska, you don't just get to go to Hawaii because you're like, well, I'm the man. No. Guess what? Pack your bags. You're going to Alaska. Because that's sacrificial love. And that's what we're called to. We are called to set the tone. We are called to love in the same way that Jesus loves us. And that is sacrificially. When you think of all that Jesus did for us, people who re rebelled against God's plan, people who said, I know, God, that you have a standard, but we're going to do it our way, and we know better than, than you know. And yet God still loved us in spite of that so much that he came to this world to pay the price that we couldn't pay to die for us so that we could have a relationship with God. Think of all that Jesus sacrificed for us. And that is what we are called to sacrifice for our wives. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is God's design, that when you're married, that's your family. When you're married, that's your family. And this can be a hard concept for a lot of people to understand. It doesn't mean that you don't appreciate your parents and all that they've done for you. But when you're married, your family is your spouse and your kids while you're raising them. But when they get old enough and they go off to be married, they now have an obligation to their spouse. And that's their primary family. And so some of you just need to stop worrying so much about what your mother and father think. Because you've been out of the house for a really long time. And one of the biggest causes of fights with you and your spouse is the fact that you still value your parents as much, maybe even not more so, than your spouse. And it's a dangerous place to be, and it goes contrary to God's design. It doesn't mean that you cut off your parents. It doesn't mean that you don't love them. It doesn't mean that you don't value them. But your primary commitment, your primary responsibility is to your spouse. And your kids, while well, they are under your care. Now, I understand in our society, under your care can mean up to 40. But, you know, realistically, that also goes against the biblical design of things. All right? And I don't mean to hate on any of you who are getting free rent. I mean, whatever works. But listen, God's design is when you're married, that's your family. And that needs to be your focus. And yeah, you absolutely still love and care and concern about your parents. But they're no longer, they're, they're not equal. They're not equal to the care and concern that you have for your spouse. And so some of you just need to quit caring what your mom thinks and what your dad thinks so much. And you still love them and you value them, but you need to have a boundary there. And you need to elevate the needs of your spouse over the needs of your parents. Then he says this. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife 
as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Husbands, you set the tone. You set the tone. And you are called to love your wife sacrificially in the same way that Jesus loves us. And you might be like, but Brian, you don't know, you don't know the battle axe that I'm married to. I mean, that woman is, it doesn't matter. You are called to love her in the same way that Jesus loved the church. You aren't responsible for her. You are responsible for you. You set the tone. You love her. You elevate her. You cherish her. You exalt her needs above your own. You sacrifice for her. You protect her. You love her well. That's what you can control. Wives, be inclined to follow the lead of your husband. Make that your disposition. And you, you might be like, you don't know the jerk that I'm married to. You picked him. Again, you control what you can handle. And this doesn't mean that if, if he tells you to do something illegal, you just walk along with it. No, but what it does mean is be inclined to follow the lead of your husband. Jesus is our example. He's our example in how to love our wives. He's our example in that we need to be willing to sacrifice everything to elevate someone else. In the love that we give. Husbands, look to Jesus. And wives, look to Jesus. Because our greatest hope, and our only hope, arises from an act of submission. It was just hours before Jesus would be crucified. Before Jesus would go to the cross to pay the penalty for my mistakes and my sins and your mistakes and your sins. And he was in a garden with his friends. One of them had already betrayed him, so he wasn't there yet, but he was coming. Jesus and his friends were in the garden. And then Jesus went a little further with some of his best friends. And they had a talk. And they were exhausted from all that they had seen, all that they had experienced in just the last week alone. And Jesus said, hey, pray for me. And they fell asleep. And Jesus went off by himself. And in the quietness of that moment, he prayed to his father and he said, take this cup from me. If there's any other way than for me to go to the cross, Let's do it that way. But not my will. But yours be done. Our hope. Our salvation. Results from an act of submission. Jesus 
is our standard for how to love and how to submit. And if we operate according to God's design and God's plan, our marriages and our lives will experience more blessing than we can fathom. But it requires us to die to our own desires and elevate one another. God, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you'd help us love. I pray that you'd help us love our wives in the way that you've loved us. I pray, God, that you would help people submit and put the disposition of their husband more so than their own. God, that we would elevate one another. That we would put their needs first. That our marriages would be a picture of service and sacrifice. That we wouldn't allow culture to define these things. But we'd follow your plan. that we would submit to one another, that we would love one another, that we would elevate each other. God, I pray for the marriages in this room right now that are struggling. And I pray that these concepts and these ideas would be introduced. And God, not that any of us are perfect, but that we would have more days where we love and elevate the needs of our spouse rather than ourselves than we would have days where we elevate our own needs. God, that that would become a, just a part of how we function. And I pray, God, that as we follow your plan for marriage, that you would protect our marriages. Help us make the right choices. Help us do the right things. Help us love one another, serve one another, elevate one another, submit to one another. And in the process, point one another closer to you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.